invite you to turn with me to uh, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 10 this morning. If you're using a copy of the scripture in the pew back in front of you, you're going to find that on page 1806. If you're turning there, let me just say what a joy it is to be back with you uh, after, what, about six or so weeks. It's been great to spend the last this past weekend with several of you in various meetings as we've d discussed uh, the church plant in northwest Indiana. It's been wonderful to get to know you. We've enjoyed some good food together, some wonderful fellowship time together, and so it's very encouraging for me to be back in your presence this morning. I have five books in my library by uh, an Australian pastor from the late 1800s named F.W. Borum. One of those books is entitled A Bunch of Everlastings. It's one of my favorite books. And what F.W. Borum did was he would take a particular individual through redemptive history and he would write a chapter on that individual and all of the efforts, the works of things that they were doing, but that would lead them to one particular text, one particular verse that would become, as he entitled it, their life verse. And he would show why it was their life verse, how it drove them closer to the Savior. Now, friends, I just get one more shot. Like I said last time, it's, it's difficult for a pastor to come in and to preach one sermon and not use the entire book uh, expositorily, but I get one more shot. Uh, but I want to share with you my life verse. This is the verse that I have in my margin in verse, uh, in verse 9. This is my life verse. We'll read it here in just a moment. I wish I could say that I am very very faithful at keeping the, this particular verse, but that would go against the very thing that I want to tell you, and that is that we're not to boast about ourselves, we're only to boast in the one who rests upon us, the power of Christ himself who reigns and dwells within us. So we boast in our weakness, because when we do that, we boast in his strength, and then through Christ we can accomplish all things. With that understanding, then, dear friends, my life verse, let's give our full attention to the reading and the preaching of God's holy, infallible, and inerrant word, beginning in chapter 12, verse 1. Hear now the word of God. I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows. I know that this man was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain, refrain so that no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan who used it to torment me. Three times I pled with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Friends, this is the word of the Lord, and what we know about God's word is that the grass withers and the flowers fall but his word will never, ever perish. Let's pray together. Father, we would pray that you would simply open our eyes to behold wonderful, beautiful things from this portion of your holy law, that we might be convicted by the power of the Spirit who searches us and tries us to see how we boast in ourselves, that we would repent of that, turn from that, and we would boast in our weakness and the sufficiency of Christ who is our strength. Do that work today, please, we pray, in all of your saints, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Everything is big in Texas. Everything is big in Texas, and I have one case in point to tell you about. I came from the city of McKinney, which is up north of Dallas. The city right next to us is the city of Allen. 
And back in 2012, Allen Independent School District announced that they were going to build a $60 million high school football stadium. There are two sacred days in Texas, and that is Sunday morning and Friday night. And Friday night is high school, high school football. And it is like another god to, to, to certain Texans, a $60 million high school stadium for a high school team. Well, all of the politicians began to boast and to brag about how this was going to do great things for the economy, great things for the city, and how it was going to draw us all together. The parents began to boast and to brag about oh, how glad we are to have our children in this particular school district. And even the students at Allen High School began to boast and to brag, saying, I'm just so glad that I'm a student at the best school district in the state of Texas because we have the biggest football stadium that cost the most money. They finished the stadium just in time to begin a new, a new uh, year, school year, and suddenly an engineer was called in and they found all kinds of cracking in the, in the concrete in, at, the, at the base, at the foundation of the stadium. And for this entire season, while this great big stadium stood right in front of everybody, they could not use it because they had to go back and redo all of the foundation to be sure that the thing would collapse once all of the 18,000 people gathered in the stadium. Well, in 2016, McKinney Independent School District, where I used to pastor in McKinney, Texas, McKinney Independent School District was not going to be one-upped by Allen Independent School District, so they announced that they were going to build a $70 million high school football stadium in the city of McKinney. And that began this boasting and bragging back and forth between those who live in McKinney and those who live in Allen. And all of the ones in McKinney were saying, our stadium's going to be bigger than your stadium. Our stadium costs more money than your stadium. Oh, well, you're just stealing our idea. We thought of it before you thought of it, everyone in Allen would say. And back and forth they would go. And some, uh, somewhere along the line, some of the students at Allen would say, well, you're going to have the same problem that we had. Your stadium's going to find cracks all in it, and you're not going to be, oh, no, we would never do the same mistakes that you did back and forth and back and forth until they finished the stadium and an engineer was called in because there were cracks. They had added too much water to the concrete when they mixed it, and there were cracks all in the foundation of this now $70 million that had exceeded it, actually, because they went overpriced, more than $80 million stadium that sat vacant for a while until they could shore things up. Well, that silenced a lot of boasting and bragging until they both moved into the stadium, of course, and then they were right back to it. Everything is big in Texas. That's not our state motto, but it's true. Everything is big in Texas, especially their pastors. I mean, just look at me. <laughs> I got to tell you, I've been thinking about the independent school districts these last couple of weeks as I've not only candidated here, but been candidating uh, as the Lord has been gracious in bringing us back into ministry, and I've been sitting with search teams that have said, tell us your story, tell us your ministry, tell us about what all you have done, what all it is that you've accomplished. And I felt like, oh my gosh, I've got to sit here and I've got to, I got to boast. Well, I took uh, the original church that I planted went from a core group of 50 people to 400 people. And then the second church that I planted went to a, you know, from about 25 out of the mother church to about 75 today and so forth. And I, just, I, I felt like I was just doing nothing but boasting and bragging about the things that I had done. And then I just kept, but Brian, this is your verse. Your verse is, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. And here you are talking about all of these wonderful things. And what I really wanted to say was that the very last verse of our, of our text this morning, I wanted to say, I want to tell you about my weaknesses. I want to tell you about how many insults I have endured low these 24, 23 years of ministry and how many hardships I've had, how many persecutions I've endured, all the difficulties that I have endured as well. Because that would be true. 
that would be true for me to tell you it was not easy, there was a lot of pain. And along the way, many times, I found myself boasting in my own strength, boasting in my own power that I was going to be the one to accomplish then this. And that's why, friends, this verse has become my life verse. Oh, how easy it is for us to boast about ourselves, is it not? We boast about the wonderful things that we think that we have accomplished. We boast about our strengths. We do it often. And when we don't find ourselves doing that, sometimes, many times, we boast in our weaknesses, saying that we've got it worse than anybody else. We try to boast about how strong we are when we boast about how weak we are. Because I've got it worse. I've suffered a lot more than you've suffered. My difficulties have been greater difficulties than your difficulties have been. And that is exactly what we read right here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul is battling with the church at Corinth about individuals who are tearing down his ministry. And he doesn't want to boast about his own ministry. He doesn't want to boast about in his strengths because that's the very point. He has none. He's weak. But Christ's grace is sufficient. And when we rest in our weaknesses and Christ is strong, then the power of the Savior rests upon us. Pride is an ugly, ugly thing, loved ones. But our spiritual pride is even uglier than that. When we think that we have the ability to do things in the context of the church, we can go out and build a church in northwest Indiana. And by our strength and our efforts, our marketing, our canvassing, our social networks, whatever it may be, we can do this. And we can do this and we can see a huge body there for the sake of Christ. When we rest in that, in our power, friends, we have already failed before we have begun. But we must begin at this place, that we are nothing, that we are weak as weak can be. But the Savior who rests upon us, who rests in us, is our strength. And we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And so we must boast in our weakness. Paul doesn't say we shouldn't boast. He says that we shouldn't boast in our strengths, but we should boast in our weakness because when we are weak, then Christ is strong. So let's look at this passage very briefly in those two ways. The way we boast when we think that we're better than anybody else and the way that we boast when we think we've got it worse than anybody else. Look at how it begins, chapter 12, verse 1. I must go on boasting. You only read that sentence and you have got to go back because we're right in the middle of a thought, obviously. And so there is context that must be gained before. And that context actually comes to us from chapters 10 and chapter 11. It's what uh, some, some commentators refer to as the fourth letter to the church at Corinth or the severe letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. But what we find in chapters 10 and 11 is that Paul is telling the church at Corinth this. Listen, we were among you. We shared our lives with you. We shared the gospel with you. And now after we have left, individuals have come in and they have torn down the very foundation that we have built, the foundation of the gospel of grace. He refers to these individuals as super apostles. And he says, you're listening to the super, super apostles who are doing nothing but boasting in themselves to eliminate us, to tear us down. And so chapters 10 and 11, we have this very thing, that Paul is defending his ministry. Paul is identifying these false apostles or these super apostles. Paul is talking about his suffering, uh, how he was whipped uh, 30 times, my, uh, thir 40 times minus one, 30 times with lashes and so forth, in order to say, look at them, look at what those, these guys are doing that you're being that you're being convinced by, that you're turning to. As you turn away from the true gospel, you turn to their gospel, which is no gospel at all, because all, of their, all they're doing is boasting about their own strengths, how much better they are than us. And so Paul begins then with this revelation. I must go on boasting, although there's nothing to be gained. I'm going to go on to boast about visions and revelations. They must have been... The Corinthians must have been talking about the super apostles, talking about how they too had had visions and revelations. And so Paul goes to that very thing. 
And he said, I know a man who 14 years ago was caught up to heaven. But notice what he says, friends. He says it twice, whether in the body or apart from the body, I don't know. Whether in the body or apart from the body, I don't know. But 14 years ago, all I know is he saw inexpressible things, and he was not permitted to tell anyone about these things. Now, the ironic thing is, Paul says, I'll talk about that man. I'm not going to talk about myself, but I'll talk about that man when Paul was that man. Look how verse 7 begins. To keep me, to keep me from becoming conceited about these surpassingly great revelations. I was given a thorn in the flesh. Paul is the man that went to the third heaven. But for 14 years, he had kept this silent. He had told no one because he was told not to tell anyone. He was permitted to see things, but he was not permitted to share those things. And for 14 years, Paul never boasted about it. Now, John was given a revelation, and he was told, write this down, because I want to share this with the church. And we know that today is the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. But Paul was given a revelation 14 years before the writing of this, and he didn't say one word. He didn't boast about it at all, because we're not supposed to know about it. But that is the very point. Do you know how much ink has been spilt over this verse? Oh, let me... I know what that third heaven looks like. I know what that vision was. I know those surpassingly great things that Paul saw. No, we don't, because this is the only place in Scripture where Paul talks about going to the third heaven. But that is the point, my friends. Paul is not boasting about the revelation that he had when he went to the third heaven. He had kept it silent for 14 years because he was boasting only about the power of Christ that was alive and well within him. That's why he would say then at the end of verse 6, I will refrain. I'm not going to talk about these revelations, although I could because they're true. Your revelations aren't true, O super apostles, but mine are true because I did go to the third heaven. But I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to refrain, verse 6, so that no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. Here's what Paul knew to be true, loved ones, and what we must know to be true as well, and that is to elevate ourselves is to eliminate Christ. To elevate ourselves is to eliminate Christ. To elevate our good works, the things that we think that we can do, the things that we think we can do by our own strength and our own power, is to strip Christ of who he is and what he has done. The power of Christ in us, at work in us, resting upon us, That's the focus that Paul drives us to. He even quoted from Jeremiah chapter 9. Back in chapter 10 of uh, the text at the very end, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. He quotes Jeremiah chapter 9 because that is what we're called to do as those who love the Lord Jesus. Not to boast in ourself, but Christ himself, the Savior himself, tells us to boast in him and his strength and his power. Charles Spurgeon, preaching a sermon one Sunday, finished, made his way to the back door. He's standing at the back door. He's greeting all of the saints as they're coming out of the church. He's shaking hands, and one of, his, one of the dear elderly women in his congregation said, Oh, Mr. Spurgeon, that was the greatest sermon I think I've ever heard in my life. And he said, I know the devil whispered it to me in my ear as I stepped down the steps out of the pulpit. Isn't that what we need, friends? Just when we think we've got ourselves right up there and whoop, somebody pulls the carpet right out from under us and we realize this is our verse. This is our life verse. My grace is sufficient for you, the Savior said. Boast in me. Don't boast in yourself. Couldn't we boast? I don't know all of the history of this church, but I know some of it. Could we boast about being faithful to the word? So much so that we would even leave one denomination and enter into another denomination because we are faithful. We are not like those people down there, but we are these people over here. Couldn't we boast in that? No, we must never boast in that. Couldn't we boast in our own strengths, in the things that we have accomplished in our own life? No, we must never boast in thinking that we are better, have it better, do it better. Never should we do that. We would refrain so that someone else might think more highly of us than they ought. 
That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's not better than everybody else. He's weak. But not only is he weak in his strengths, he's also weak in his suffering. Look how the passage moves us in verse 7. Now to keep me from being conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, I was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, something that he used to torment me, and I pleaded with the Lord three times to take it away, and he didn't take it away. Sometimes, isn't this true of you, dear friend? If you're honest with yourself before the Savior, it's true of me. Sometimes I delight in boasting in my own abilities, my own strengths to do something, and when the Lord, real, or when the Lord reveals that to me, then, then I turn and I think, well, my gosh, I got it so bad. Look, they, I got it worse than anybody else. I've never suffered. Uh, they've never suffered the way I've suffered. Now Paul moves on to this, this physical torment, this thorn that's in his flesh, this difficulty that he is having. And so much ink has been spilled on this particular verse. Oh, look what large letters I'm writing with my hands. Oh, Paul must have had bad eyesight. Or look what letters I'm writing with my hands. Oh, he must have had arthritis so bad he couldn't even hold the quill and the ink or whatever they used on that particular day. Friends, we don't know. This is the only place in Scripture where Paul talks about these things. But that is the very point. Not only that Paul is trying to make, but the, Paul, uh, the point that I want to make for you as well. We don't know what the thorn in his flesh was. And so we ought not to get caught up in that, but focus on the very thing that Paul is driving us to. And that is even in our suffering, even in our limitations, even in our difficulties, our strength is only in the one who rests upon us and rests in us, and that is Christ himself. But I want you to see something, friends. Look at verse 7. This surpassing great revelation, this thorn in the flesh was given to me. The Greek word there is the same Greek word that's used throughout the New Testament when we are reading something that is given to us as a gift from our gracious Heavenly Father. Paul is saying that this is a gift from God Himself, even though the Lord didn't take it away. Three times I pleaded with Him to take it away. But it is the sovereign will of God the Father to keep me with this thorn in the flesh, whether it's a person who was nagging him or a physical ailment, we don't know, but it was given to him by Christ. And that is the very thing he goes on to say that the messenger of Satan would use to torment him. Sovereignty and suffering. Have you ever thought about that, that God's sovereign power is seen in the suffering situation Friends, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, is it here? There's one somewhere. There's one in your mind. There is no greater place. I had one on my, the back wall. I just, that's why I was pointing to that. No greater place than God's sovereignty and suffering than the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. That it was God's will to turn his face away from the Father, or uh, to turn his face away from the Son, and allow the Son to suffer and die for people like you and me. There is no greater place of sovereignty and suffering than the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, as Paul says, I'm not going to focus on the difficulty, but look what he says in verse 10. I am going to focus in my delights. I'm going to delight, even in the midst of the suffering that I'm enduring. Now, that's, friends, don't hear me say, just, you know, cheer up. Cheer up, it's not that bad. You don't have it so bad. Your pain is real. I know your pain is real. My pain is real. Our suffering is real. But here's what we are called to do, and that is to focus on the sovereignty of our gracious God who has given this to us. He says, I delight in this weakness. In the, in the Greek word there, delight means to be content in, to be content with, to find it sufficient. Can you say, loved one, Hear me, can you say, I am content even in the midst of the hardship, the suffering, the difficulty that my life, in my life I'm experiencing right now? It is the gift that God has given to me. Could you ever think that your very limitation, whatever the thorn is in your life, would be the very thing that the Savior would use to the proclamation of his world and the, the, the extension of his kingdom here on earth? 
Did you ever think that whatever ailment you're having, whatever limitation, whatever thorn in your flesh right now could be the very thing that the Savior would use to build his kingdom, not only here at Christ Church and in Lansing, but also in Northwest Indiana? Sovereignty and suffering together for the sake of this. His grace is sufficient for us. His power is made perfect in our weakness. Now, friends, listen very carefully. I am not saying to you, just get out there and be like Paul. This is not a moralistic sermon of get out there like Paul did and sola bootstraps, uh, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and just quit being so boastful and start being the, the down guy or gal. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying what Paul has experienced here and what you and I have, are to experience here is that we are not simply to talk about the gospel of grace, but we're to live the gospel of grace. We can't just come into our four walls and talk about our sacred doctrines that we love, that I believe you cut me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bleed reformed blood. I'm a five-point Calvinist unashamedly. But we can't simply talk about those doctrines and not live those doctrines out in the world in which God has placed us. We cannot talk about repenting and turning from our sin simply with lip service instead of the lives that we share together in this gospel of grace, truly repenting to one another as we live the gospel of grace out together. As we get into Crown Point, Northwest Indiana, it's not just going to be effective for us to stand and proclaim the truth of the gospel, but we're going to get into the community, or I pray that you will get into the community and live this same gospel out. It's so transformed you from the inside. It's exactly what Jesus says to the woman at the well. It's like a spring of living water that boils up from within me. And from the inside out then, I am living this gospel that is resting on me, that is resting in me, and that is Jesus the Christ, who told us, by the way, listen, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will find it. That's what we're called to do. To boast in our weakness to let Christ be strong, the one who reigns and dwells within us as we live out this gospel of grace that has transformed us from the inside out. A mother was cooking some pancakes one Saturday morning when her two sons were sitting at the table behind her. She was at the stovetop making these pancakes and, and uh, Ryan, the oldest brother, uh, five years old, said to Kevin, his younger brother, three years old, uh, when the first pancake comes, Kevin, I'm going to get that pancake uh, because I'm older than you. And then Kevin would say, oh, no, Ryan, not you. I'm younger. I'm so, I'm so hungry. I really need this more than you do. Ryan said, oh, no, I'm older. You're going to watch me eat that pancake. The mom turned around seeing an opportunity for teaching and said, boys, if Jesus were sitting at the table, he would say, I'm going to let my brother have the first pancake. There was silence. She turned around. Score. I got it. And then she heard, then she heard Ryan say to Kevin, Hey, Kevin, you be Jesus. <laughs> You are Kevin, loved one, and I am Kevin, because we love to boast about ourselves. We love to boast about the wonderful things that we have done, are doing, and can do. And when we're not boasting in our strengths, we're boasting in about how bad we've got it. We're suffering a lot worse than anyone else. Spiritual pride is the ugliest thing that you could ever see. It made the top seven of seven deadly sins, and was actually number one. It's ugly. When I am weak, then my Savior is strong. His grace is sufficient for us, friends, not only here, but in northwest Indiana, where I pray, 
where I pray we will boast in our weakness and delight in saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because he is my strength, even in the midst of my weakness. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, this is a beautiful passage to remind us that we are yours, that you are God and we are not. So we would simply pray today and every day, Father, I would pray that for the saints of First Church as we think about planting a church outside of these walls, that you would remind us in here and out there that you are our strength. We are not strong in our own efforts, in our own abilities, but we are strong in our weakness when Christ is our strength inside us, resting upon us. Remind us of that today and every day, Father, as you do your sovereign work in us and through us, and we pray it for Jesus' sake. Amen.